Hey guys, my name is Avinash Lakshman. I'm the founder and CEO of Hedwig. Uh, first off, thanks a lot for stopping by. Uh, we have been looking forward to this for uh, quite some time now. So just to kick things off, uh, by way of background, uh, prior to founding Hedwig, which was about four years ago, uh, I spent about six to eight years building large-scale distributed systems. So the two really large systems that I had built was I co-invented Amazon Dynamo while I was at Amazon. And uh, early 2007, I moved down to the Bay Area, joined Facebook, and uh, Apache Cassandra was my brainchild. So Dynamo, as you guys know, is the genesis for the entire NoSQL movement. So I've had the opportunity of not only building these systems, but also running them operationally. Right? And as my time on Facebook was coming to an end, uh, I took a deep look at what was happening in the storage infrastructure space for the modern data center. There were a lot of changes that were happening. One, the advent of you know, commodity x86 hardware. Hardware today is at a light years ahead of where it was perhaps a decade ago. Um, you know, the advent of virtualization becoming ubiquitous in the data center. Uh, and now it's, of course, it's either hypervisor-based or container-based, what have you. Uh, the cloud mentality was kind of spreading in. To me, cloud means uh, virtualization of some form plus self-provisioning. Now, the self-provisioning is key because the way you architect your systems becomes radically different, right? And also SSDs were making big inroads into the data center. And with, with all due respect, I just felt that when you look at storage, there's been no fundamental innovation for the last 10 to 15 years. And a lot of skills that I had kind of garnered over building the kind of systems I built were very germane to doing something that could really disrupt the storage space. Uh, we'll show you a lot more of what I exactly mean as the festivities continue. Um, my view, uh, the French have a saying, uh, the fate of glass is to break. I believe the fate of traditional storage is to disappear. Right? And um, when you see what we have done, a lot of these things will kind of fall in place. Over the last few years, we've spoken to so many customers, it's actually mind-boggling to realize that almost every single one of them has a major agenda to look at alternative architectures from a storage perspective. They want to kind of rid themselves of the traditional storage that they have been beholden to, right? For me personally, it's been a real life realization of what the great Victor Hugo said. No army can withstand the strength of an idea whose time has come. I hope that, I mean, I do believe that the idea is what we are building. I hope that we can bring it to the market in a way where the business can also flourish. And uh, having said that, I think we have a pretty long agenda today, so I wouldn't want to take up a lot more of your time. A uh, couple of things that I wanted to bring, uh, bring to your attention. Some of the demos that we're going to show you are going to be reflection of real-world deployments that are happening with our platform. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy what we're going to show you today as much as you know we have enjoyed building the system over the past few years. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Avinash. So I certainly encourage you to ask questions. If it is technical in nature, I'm probably going to punt it because we've designed sort of everybody after me to, to hopefully get you that content. So if any, if any questions on sort of the overall business and things like that, Avanash, certainly happy to, to take them now. Uh, so to get started, I, I don't want to do a lot of setup. You guys know the market well. Those folks viewing know the market <coughs> well. I just want to give you our particular spin on what we're seeing in our customers because <coughs> there are some common threads we see throughout. So I think all of us know that we're seeing a focus on of innovation. It could be around how to globalize, it could be how to compete and gain new customers, it could be how to engage customers. I won't use fancy terms like digital transformation and all that, but the idea is technology is at the forefront of a lot of business agenda. What this ultimately means to us is a pressure on time to market for developers. So Avinash spent a lot of time talking about the self-service driven nature. Thanks to things like AWS, we know that infrastructure has become very uh, developer friendly. And ultimately what that means in our world is the need for flexible infrastructure. To be honest, our customers don't care if it's hardware defined, software defined, it doesn't really matter so much as it's just simply more flexible. They can change it to accommodate the new projects and services, the new architectures that the business is putting forward. 
to kind of back things up. So we really kind of stepped back to say, okay, given this need to create that more flexible infrastructure, what are some of the challenges, right? And we see a handful. I'm just going to go through them quickly. Uh, I'm not trying to sort of overstate. I don't think any one customer suffers from all of these, but just to give you an idea of the things that are articulated back to us, right? First and foremost, this concept of predictably scaling out and back in. So the concept that things can be elastic. And so what we want to do is actually sort of demonstrate that. But by and large, the storage industry has got scale out down, but the scale back part is something that isn't inherent to quite a few of the platforms. We also know that a lot of our customers are looking to better leverage commodity economics. And so as new Intel processors come out, as new flash innovations come out, it's not waiting for the 12 to 18 month design cycle and then waiting for the three to five year refresh cycle to live with that. But instead, once it hits its economic sweet point, I mean, today it could be six terabyte drives, tomorrow it could be eight or 10 terabyte drives, it could be new flash, right? To be able to, as soon as they feel it's at the right procurement point for them, <coughs> to be able to roll that in and have the software just be able to accommodate that. The next thing is, in addition to the hardware, the software needs to be able to take in new innovations, right? Everything from Tesla being able to do over the air updates to the car, understanding how software can be an appreciating asset that helps get the system bigger, better over time is something a lot of our customers are looking for. And then as you'll see, to be able to then change and adapt the software to the needs of particular applications. Just a couple more. So another thing that we've learned is that high availability needs to be rethought a little bit. Um, to do it and take a page from the web scale or hyperscale guys, Amazon, Facebook, Google, we really need to build for failure and just assume failure is going to be part of it. But how can you do it in such a way where the application doesn't know the underlying infrastructure has had any type of component node or even data center level failures? And then the next two kind of go hand in hand, which is how do I invest in the right level of performance at each tier without having to overpay for that performance at each tier? So we're big fans of an all-flash tier. We think our customers all have all-flash tiers. Usually that sits a bit above us. We're sort of the tiers below that that are up for the data. And so how do I architect for tiers one, two, and three, if you consider all-flash zero or two and three? It doesn't really matter to us so much as just making sure that we understand the performance profile. And at the same time, how do you create a system that can be automated and fits into a simpler IT operations workflow? Right. So these are sort of the six design goals and sort of principles that uh, Avinash was looking at about four years ago when we really kicked off. Make sense? Hopefully this, none of this is earth shattering. Great. So what have we built? Well, we are software defined storage. Unfortunately, we're at a point in time where I need to define what software defined means because it means a little bit of everything to everybody. At the highest level, it means you take for us an off the shelf commodity <coughs> server. By the way, commodity to us does not mean cheap, cheap. It just simply means you can pretty much get the same SKU from any one provider and the overall quality and underlying components are the same. So we provide recommended SKUs based on sort of the workloads and, and, and the needs of, of a particular application. We take that standard server, deploy our software directly onto that, right? So there's nothing between our software and that underlying. And then we cluster all those nodes together to create that elastic distributed storage fabric. And then we actually expose traditional storage protocols out of that cluster. So we'll go into it in a lot more depth. But we are, uh, one thing you'll know is we, we can hyperconverge and we can also deploy in a non hyperconverged mode. And we'll talk about that, it'll become clear when we get into the actual software architecture. However, I think there's a few more things that just need to be highlighted when it comes to software defined. Right. The first is that the software is completely decoupled from the hardware. Right. So uh, I think that's probably the only part of the definition we can all agree on. Right. Is that it's divorced from that commodity hardware. We don't have any dependencies on it. <coughs> the second is the application specificity and the fact that the application can actually program and determine the underlying. I've always wanted to use control plane and data plane type analogies and storage, but it doesn't quite fit as well as it does in the networking world. But the idea is that a storage could dictate, an application could dictate its underlying storage needs, just like an application may dictate its underlying network needs, I think is a core tenet of software defined. 
And then finally, the third one is that because of that, it can truly be automated and API driven. So it's not that you can just have a handful of APIs, but instead is the platform inherently architected to be API driven. Every aspect can be instrumented. And whether that's the provisioning, the configuration, the management, the monitoring, all elements can be called. And that's our more sophisticated customers have don't even use the web UI, which we'll show you, or the command line. They actually go straight to an API driven in order to, <coughs> to put it into a more cloud-like environment. Okay, so at this point, I've given you a little bit of a flavor for what we think Software Defined is. What I want to talk through is just sort of the high-level attributes of our platform. Uh, and then you'll see this in a lot more depth in the demo when we go through how we provision all of this capability. Uh, the first is, when we say commodity, it could be an x86 or it could be an ARM 64-bit. Now, I'll be honest, we haven't seen a single ARM 64 deployment yet. But it is interesting, we do see some large companies who are building out their commodity strategies, thinking about, wow, if I really built a distributed scale-out architecture, a low-power ARM and flash-based deployment could be really interesting to me. So we sort of made so your, a... Your, your distribution, your software distribution is ready for ARM, so you yes. don't need to... Yeah. Precisely. So now, if you're going to ask, can you run this on a Raspberry Pi? Probably not, right? So <laughs> hardware still matters, but it'll compile and run on the appropriate ARM64 server. The next is this concept of hyperconverged and hyperscale. So I'll, I'll double click on the next slide in terms of what we mean by that, but suffice it to say, hyperscale is non-hyperconverged. It's sort of a traditional SAN-like architecture where the storage tier is completely decoupled from the compute tier. <coughs> We can mix and match in the same cluster. So we actually would say deploy based on your workload needs. Obviously, things like VDI or small offices, hyperconverged is a good fit. For larger applications and more dynamic applications, maybe it's not a good fit. And you can, more importantly, change your mind over time. Another thing that we've focused a lot on is uh, supporting a wide breadth of compute environments. So. This is the compute environment that's consuming us as its storage platform. So today we support all the major hypervisor flavors, uh, Zen, KVM, Hyper-V, ESX, obviously. But we also support containers. We can provision storage uh, natively to containers. We also support OpenStack. We also support bare metal, Linux and Windows. And so the idea is, regardless of that compute layer, we can provide storage. And there's a couple different technical things that allow us to do that. But for now, we allow that. Now, in the presentation. we don't necessarily have all of these abstractions in our backend storage system, right? Uh, this is more just the client side of the equation. The next thing is the platform was architected to provide block file and object all from the same platform. So we'll demonstrate this as well. Block to us is iSCSI, file to us is NFS today and then object is S3 and Swift. Now, we're not any one of those things underneath, right? We're not an object store that then masquerades block and file. We're sort of our own distributed system on the back end, and all of these are basically an access tier and northbound interfaces to us. <coughs> now, the next thing, a lot of our customers have hit a stumbling block in software-defined storage where it was good for test and dev, but they couldn't quite roll it into production because it was missing some key capabilities. And so one of the things we've tried to, to do is architect a pretty full feature set. So parity with what your hardware solution would have had, but done in all software. Um, and so that means things like dedupe and compression. It means tiering and caching and all different layers built in, uh, as well as things like snapshots and clones, right? So sort of the, the capabilities the customers are asking for today, but the more important part is that all of these capabilities can be toggled on or off at a volume level, or what we call a virtual disk. And so what that means is you could have um, a particular high availability policy, you could have a particular snapshot, uh, you could do compression for one volume, and then have a volume right next to it have a completely different set of policies. And that's what we think gives it that application specificity. I don't want to say application awareness, but the idea that you can tailor the, the underlying storage to the application needs. And then finally, one of the <coughs> most unique aspects of our platform and building on Avinash's background in distributed systems is it's inherently a multi-site architecture. So we can deploy our nodes across any number of sites 
and then cluster all those together into a big <coughs> elastic pool of storage. Now to us, the site could be a data center. It could also be a public cloud running an instance of our software, <coughs> right? So it's also a hybrid architecture by default as well. And we'll actually, uh, in the whiteboard session towards the end of today, actually talk about some customers that are, that are interested in architecting this. So now, what this ultimately allows when you power some of the uh, capabilities above is you can write unique DR or HA policies, right? You could say, for this application, I want it protected across sites A, B, and C, but for a different application, I can go completely different or I can relax it, right? So it really allows you to have a much more flexible uh, set of parameters that can be tuned. Make sense of This all will yeah. be detailed uh, in a bit. So the three software components that I just want to familiarize yourself, you'll hear these again in the whiteboard, is the system itself, the, the, the core intelligence is our backend Hedvig storage service. It's actually the software that gets deployed on that bare metal commodity server. It's where all the intelligence lives. It's where all the replication, it's the distributed system, it's where all the dedupe compression, all of that gets done on the back end. But we do have a very lightweight, it's actually a stateless software component. We call it a storage proxy. Its goal in life is twofold. Northbound, it speaks block and file protocols. It then terminates those protocols and converts it to our own network optimized protocol out the back end. So it's basically just a protocol converter. And it also does caching, right? Now, for us, if you deploy this storage proxy at your application tier, that's hyperscale. You're decoupling applications from compute. If you take this proxy and bundle it in with the storage service, it's hyperconverged. You're basically saying my applications and my VMs are co-resident on the same physical node as my backend storage services, right? And then finally, we have a full set of RESTful APIs. This is, first of all, how you do object storage. So object storage does not flow through our proxy. We speak S3 and Swift natively in the cluster, but it's also how you would do all the basic control plane and data plane, if I can stretch the analogy, in and out of the platform. So let me just give you a super quick animated version of how the system works. Uh, sure. Back to the storage proxy again. Yeah. So if the storage proxy and the storage service are running on the same server, it's a hyperconversion environment, is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, there's a slight twist to it. It's the application VM should also be running on the same. Because your applications and your storage needs to be... So when you're not in hyperconverged, the storage proxies run on the client? Yes. Uh, we'll get into more details about how yes. that actually kind of plays out. Yeah, can I ask you, so looking at other vendors now uh, showing up with a software-defined solution, they are very, very focused on uh, the next wave, you know, containers and uh, OpenStack and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So very, very, very policy-based focus, automation, and all around. And you are still focused on the infrastructure part of the storage, you know? So you are solving the traditional problem with a the, with the new kind of infrastructure, but actually you are not uh, focused on, the, on all this automation stuff. So making the, the, the storage transparent to the upper layers. So, and potentially it's something that you can do because uh, uh, you have, the APIs already, but uh, is this a strategic yeah. positioning or? Uh, no, that's incorrect. And what I would uh, urge you is hold that thought. Mm -hmm. As this progresses, your answer will be, your question will be answered okay. automatically. Thank you. So imagine you've got sort of a mixed environment. It could be a containerized environment, right, where our proxy in this case <coughs> would actually deploy in a container could be a traditional hypervisor environment. In this case, the proxy would deploy as a VM. By the way, the proxy can also be deployed as a bare metal proxy server, right? So you don't have to have one per compute. We'll talk about the advantages of why. Um, and then you can imagine the API set if you were doing maybe an OpenStack cloud for, for Swift. The first step in the process is an administrator either provisions a virtual disk or through the APIs, you would script a virtual disk creation, right? So that virtual disk, for the, for the sake of simplicity, I'm showing this proxy masquerading as block storage. It can actually do block and file, so I'm just separating it out here for illustration purposes. But what would happen is this would be presenting iSCSI, this virtual disk would be NFS, this could be S3 or Swift. The second step in the process is that storage proxy then terminates the local storage traffic and sends it out via our own kind of network optimized API calls into the underlying cluster. 
Then what happens is once the data reaches the cluster, two things happen. First of all, it gets distributed based on policy. So if we allow you to set a replication factor, we make sure that, that replication factor is adhered to. <laughs> And then there's a bunch of background tasks that also happen to make sure the data is continuously kind of tiered and balanced based on the overall needs of, of the cluster and to make sure that we sort of balance as best we can across the distributed system. And then the last thing, which isn't a distinct step, but we then allow that cluster to span multiple physical sites or even clouds, right? So we do allow that uh, we have a combination, as we'll get into, of both synchronous and asynchronous replication built into the platform, and that allows us to, to, to do replication across great distances into different sites. So that's a little bit of the terminology, a little bit of how it works. The next whiteboard session is going to go in a lot more depth, including a little bit of anatomy of a read and write in the platform. The last thing I just want to talk about, and maybe uh, <coughs> we could to answer your question a little bit. So ultimately what this means is there are sort of a traditional set of storage use cases, kind of workloads that our platform uh, lends itself well to, but there's also a series of sort of the newer. Um, so production clouds could be based on containers, it, it could be based on uh, OpenStack, um, a lot of test dev environments, uh, operational analytics, big data sensor networks, right? And so for us, it's actually, Kind of think of it as the quality of the underlying server determines your IOPS and the quantity of servers determines your availability. And we basically, through that and all the policies that can be set in the platform, can tailor the workload, right? So what, how you would deploy us for Docker does look a lot different than how you would deploy us for uh, you know, a basic archive or maybe a warm archive or as a backup target. But you can mix and match those hardware profiles heterogeneously in the cluster and then through software be able to handle how the workload then resides. 